Good morning, good morning, ladies uh, and uh, gentlemen. Uh, great to uh, have you back. Great to see you here in the audience. I hope you all had a wonderful gala dinner, and I saw some of you on the dance floor last night, so it's great that, that you're still back here at 9 a.m. for what uh, is promising to be a very important and very interesting session, improving access in cities, findings from Europe and Latin America, ladies and gentlemen. This session uh, will look at how we shift the policy focus from increasing movement to improving access, how to put access issues higher in the political agenda and guide decision makers more effectively. To that ex uh, extent, the ITF, the OECD and the EU have uh, developed a common set of indicators and a benchmarking tool for imp improving access in European and Latin American cities. These findings will be presented here. Before then, we move on with a wonderful set of speakers for the following panel. To kick off the findings, uh, I'm delighted to hand over to the head of the economic analysis sector at DG for Regional Urban Policy at the European Commission. Lovely to have you here. Luis Dijkstra, uh, very curious to see what the findings entail. Thank you, Ali. Glad you all made it here. Um, we're going to start off with a couple of short presentations trying to summarize the report that has just been published. Uh, and I'm going to try and distill a couple of key messages for you and explain the new framework. Um, I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, I work for the DG who's responsible for cohesion policy. We invest 50 billion a year in the less developed regions and cities in, in Europe. And so we build metro lines, train lines, we fund bus lines. But this is the first time that I'm confident that we have a good way of capturing the impact of investments and the performance of different transport networks. So we called it a new urban accessibility framework. Am I too loud? <laughs> <laughs> um, because it is new. We build on some existing indicators, but we give them a different approach, and it really works quite well. Let me first explain to you my frustration. So we tried different accessibility indicators. And one is a very simple one, absolute accessibility. You know, how many jobs can you reach in a half hour? And then we noticed, like, it's always high in big cities. And it, it's always low in small cities. And actually, here on the graph, you can see that uh, in the sense that that graph shows the relationship between absolute accessibility and the city size. So basically, you think you're talking about the transport system, but actually you're just talking about the city size. So we're like, OK, drats, that doesn't work, right? So let's try a different indicator. Uh, another popular one is relative accessibility. What share of the jobs can I reach in half an hour in this city? Now, the problem there is that you don't get a big city bias. You get a small city bias. You know, in Leipzig, if you take 45 minutes, how many jobs can you reach? Every single one. <laughs> so it's not very informative about the public transport system in Leipzig. You know. So whereas if you take in Paris or in Mexico City, you take 45 minutes, you're not going to reach every single one. So you get the opposite bias. So here, two popular accessibility indicators that we promote. You know, people say, this is how you should measure uh, the benefits of transport. And what do they do? They don't tell you anything about how the transport system works. So we wanted to come up with a different approach. So what did we do? We started off with accessibility. We said, OK, how many jobs can you reach in half an hour, for example? And then instead of just using that, we compared it to, well, how many jobs or how many destinations, it could be population, schools, hospitals, what have you, are nearby. So what's the potential number of destinations you can reach? And so then if you compare the nearby population with the accessible population or the nearby jobs with the nearby population, you can figure out, well, does the bus allow me to get there? Does the bike allow me to get there? Can I reach all of them? Can I reach all of them by car? Can I reach more jobs by car than are close by? And that's, in a nutshell, what we did. And we did it for 121 cities in Europe, and you'll hear later about a number of Latin American cities. And you can do it anywhere in the world. It's a very simple framework, but it works like a charm. Let me try and give you an example. Here, this is Strasbourg. So we start off in the middle, right there, and we draw a circle around that point, and we count uh, all the destinations. Here we do population, all the destinations in this radius. 8K radius, and that's your nearby population. And then here we check by car, how many can you reach 
in half an hour. Now, the little white blocks means you can't get there in a half hour, but some of these are further away, so in half an hour by car, you can reach more people than are nearby. So actually here in Strasbourg, you're doing all right. So if you look at the numbers, these are the number of people you can reach, the accessible population, these are the number of people who are nearby, the nearby population, and then divide one by the other. And so if you get a ratio over one, you're doing all right. Now, the other hard thing is when you're trying to compare cities, you don't want to compare a downtown in one city to a full metropolitan area in another, right? Because downtowns tend to have far more public transport uh, uh, and jobs than, say, uh, the outskirts. So what we do in this study is also we use a global definition of a functional urban area. I'm not going to explain you the full detail, although it's quite simple, but I do want to mention this is also being proposed as a global standard. Uh, next year at the UN Statistical Commission, we will ask the countries to approve this as a good definition for international comparisons. So we start with a little grid concept. We look at dense cells uh, that are contiguous, that have a minimum population of 50,000. Then we turn that into a characterization of a municipality that becomes a city, and we create a commuting zone around it. And the commuting zone plus the city is the functional urban area. And the nice thing in this study is we've looked at all three levels. So we looked at the city, we looked at the commuting zone, and the combination. So if you compare, for example, the city to the commuting zone, you can see that actually if you live in the city, you've got tons of destinations nearby, right? So that already gives you a heads up. It gives you a head start to get a higher accessibilities. And in the city for short trips, uh, following the recommendation we saw yesterday from the young researcher who got the award, we do use multiple time thresholds. Um, for short trips, the bike in the city works well. It works even better than a car, and that's why I bike to work. But in the burbs, in the commuting zone, the bike is okay, but because proximity is so low, because so few destinations are nearby, you can't access that much. So this, these three indicators really allow you to give a very good overview of the performance of the network and the characteristics of different parts of your city. And what I like about it is that it also gives a very intuitive um, comparison. You know, if you're downtown, well, you might walk somewhere, take public transport, take your bike. If you're out in the commuting zone, the car gives you such an advantage that you really don't have a lot of incentive to, to take other modes. If you compare public transport and cars, you can see, again, in the city, it does quite well for short trips. Longer trips, the car has a little bit of an advantage, gets faster out into the commuting zone, for example, or farther parts of the city. But it's only in the commuting zone that the public transport really starts to lose. There's not a lot of nearby destinations, and the performance of that network, uh, of that mode, is really quite low. It doesn't even get you to the nearby destinations, let alone further flung ones. So there, again, you see the car in the commuting zone very high. So assuming that uh, we want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, the first thing we want to do is encourage people to live in the city, because in the city, the low carbon modes are much more competitive, much more advantage. And then in the second step, we can see how we can improve the commuting zone, but it kind of gives you a nice emphasis there. Now, I could talk about this for far too long, but I won't, <laughs> and I'll pass over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. So, hello, <clears throat> I am Dimitrios Papayuanu from uh, the ITF in the OECD, and I'm going to talk about this study that we did uh, with Luis and the European Commission and CFE, the Center for Entrepreneurship of the OECD. So we applied this framework in 121 European cities. So what did we do? We used the systematic approach that Luis presented, and then we also used standardized and uniform data sources. We got the same type of sources for every city. And we use that to measure those three things, those three indicators. What is nearby, proximity, what you can reach, accessibility, and then through the two of them, how does the transport system work, the transport performance for all the different modes. So we did that for 121 cities, which are all the European capitals and all the functional urban areas with a population of more than 500,000. And we did that for the four modes, walking, cycling, uh, driving and public transport. 
So what did we measure? We didn't measure jobs, unfortunately, because we couldn't find a uniform uh, uniformal source for jobs. But we measured other destinations that we thought are useful, are important for the uh, daily life. And another thing I, I want to say is that this is not a high-level approach. We actually broke down the cities at a very fine level. We used the grid system with a 500-meter cell, and we have well over 1 million cells, so we computed a lot of indicators. <laughs> so let me try to give you a very general overview of how cities perform. So this is a graph that's talking about uh, the accessibility in cities. And let's see. So on the left side, we have proximity. So proximity in this case is eight kilometer. How many people live on a distance of eight kilometer on average on a city? And then on the other side, we have performance. In this case, is for car. So we're having car performance. And then in between the, the sum of the two, the, um, the product of the two is accessibility. So when you are on the lower left corner, you are having uh, low accessibility, and as you move right to the right and upwards, you're having high accessibility. So theoretically, a city that is located on the top corner would have very, very high accessibility. So how do European cities rank? Let's see. So we have cities where the accessibility is rather low in terms of the number of people you can reach, so less than half a million, but these are mostly small cities. And we can see that cities can reach that level of accessibility either by performing well by car, as the case of Luxembourg, or by being denser and performing a bit less good by car. But then as we go up, the next stage is between half a, half a million and 750,000, we can see again the same. You'll notice we have two UK cities here. You have London and Liverpool. They have somewhat similar accessibility levels, but London provides that almost exclusively by proximity because it's a dense city. The car, the car network in London does not perform that well. It's quite the opposite for public transport, but for car, it's not the case. So as we're moving up, we can see that there is a certain trend. Cities tr tend to spread out. They either have good uh, high proximity, so they are dense cities, or they have good, uh, good car performance, so they have an efficient car network. That means high provision of roads, of um, high density roads, and uh, high speed limits, and so on. And then we, when we go to the final category, we see these are big cities. These have an accessibility in the city of more than a million inhabitants. And most of them, like I think four out of the seven are capitals, they're all big cities. Um, but we can see there is a lack, there is no city here. So what does this mean? This probably means that this is not attainable. You cannot reach that. So when we visualize it on a map, now I just have to say the size of the circle here is the size of the, of the cities. It's not the accessibility, then the accessibility is the level. And we have a comparison car to public transport. And we can see that overall, car performs better than public transport. So why is that? Uh, it is for the thing that Louis said. The public transport network is not as efficient as the car. It's not as dense. If you notice, we also have some empty bubbles. The empty bubbles means there was no public transport information available. This does not mean they don't have public transport. It means we didn't have information for that. There was no publicly available information. But still, we got about two-thirds of the cities with public transport, which, for those who are familiar, is actually quite a good ratio. So since the density, since the proximity is the same, again, we are still talking about population because it's more uniformly spread, why is the difference? And the difference is because of the transport performance. On the left, you see all 121 cities ranked for their average car performance. And we see it ranges from, uh, sorry, it ranges from 0 0.5 to almost 2.4. Whereas for public transport, you start at 0 0.15, 0 0.1, and at best case, you're like at 0 0.9. So as we can see, even in the cities, you cannot really compare the performance of the two modes. Now, does this mean that public transport is bad? Does this mean that it's not good enough? No. Sometimes you only need to reach one destination. Having multiple destinations is good, but maybe you don't care. So in this case, we're talking about high schools, and we're looking at the commuting zone. So we're looking at areas that are sparsely populated. And you can see that actually most of them have a decent level of access 
by public transport. So there are only few of them where you have more than 50% of the, of the population not able to reach a high school in 30 minutes by public transport. So this means we are not as bad. Public transport does not perform bad, even, even in, in areas where it's not supposed to be working well. Nevertheless, what does this mean? Car and non-car modes can be enough. So if we look at cities, for again, for high school, almost everyone can go to school alone, either by walking, cycling, or using public transport. Again, other examples. An average person living in Europe can walk to 50 restaurants in 15 minutes, or can cycle to 11 square kilometers. That's a lot. OK, of course, these are averages. That includes areas that are very dense or areas that are very green. But still, that's not so bad. But we have gaps. We have gaps, especially on the commuting zones. And therefore, this will allow us to, this framework allows us to do some, to reach some conclusions that we can then pass on to policymakers. Then we can help them identify what their city is lacking, why their city is performing good, why it's performing bad, what is the driver of it. And we need to understand that high level of access can be achieved from one or the other. So you should not be chasing something that is utopic. You should be trying to understand what your city needs. And then some, I'm going to echo Lewis on some of his conclusions. So overall, car performs better, right? So car is better in almost all situations, even when you factor in congestion, even when you factor in parking times. The, only, the sole exception is cities for cycling, because cycling as a mode has less dead time, you don't have to look for parking, you don't have to, you're not st as stuck in congestion. At short distances, it performs well. But then, again, in commuting zones, you generally have car ruling over everything, but even then, even when you have a transport performance or two and above, you still cannot reach the same level of destinations than you can in the cities. So with that, I am leaving you to the following speaker, which will talk about Latin America. Good morning, everyone. And so I'm going to cover very shortly the results of the project that we have been working on with uh, Inter-American Development Bank on measuring accessibility in Latin American cities using the same methodology as we use for Europe. And we have Ernesto Monter here who will be then joining the discussion to give some reflections on the results. Um, so for this project, the objective was a little bit different. Uh, we didn't aim to benchmark accessibility levels, but rather look inside of four cities uh, Mexico City, Bogota, Santiago de Chile, and Montevideo, and look into access to jobs, look in, inside of the cities, look into spatial inequalities related to accessibility. And um, what is very important is that we also looked into contribution of informal transport, microbuses in Mexico City and Bogota, for, um, for improving accessibility. And we have Clayton Lee here, who actually went to Mexico City to collect this data and contributed a lot to making this project happen. And this is extremely important for these this cities that I mentioned because, well, somewhat 60, 70% of trips are made by informal transport. So if we do not take into account, we will be losing a lot of the results. Um, so this is what we see. This is how it point. Okay, so uh, this is absolute accessibility by different modes. How many people you can access in 30 minutes. And is, as in many other cases in Europe, what we see is car performs much better in this sense. By car you can access much higher number of opportunities. Um, I, I don't think that it was mentioned, but um, out of 121 cities that were analyzed previously in Europe, I believe that London is the only city where access by public transport uh, is higher than by car. Um, what we also see is that um, this is the same graph, the um, access by public transport. What we also see is that um, in case of Mexico City and Bogota, informal transport plays really an important role for improving accessibility. Um, in Mexico City, the improvements is somewhat 54%, and in case of Bogota, it's 34 um, And uh, we were previously talking about city size bias, but here I think the most striking result is that um, look into Mexico City, somewhat 30 million in the urban center, and Paris, 9.2 million. However, in Paris, in 30 minutes, you can access much more people compared to Mexico City. 
This is quite impressive, I believe. But um, so at this stage, we do not necessarily know what are the underlying factors to these results. We don't really know, is it because uh, Mexico City is sprawled? Is it because public transport per performs poorly? What, what are the reasons for that? So we analyzed um, uh, underlying factors, those being proximity, as we discussed previously, and public transport performance. Um, OK. I wonder how you point at the red one. Oh, OK. Oh, perfect. Uh, so what we see here, it's the sem similar bar with um, access by, absolute access by public transport. The, or, the purple triangle line is proximity, and the orange one is public transport performance. And what we see in case of Mexico City, uh, poor, relatively comparatively poor um, results in terms of absolute accessibility, has to do with very poor public transport performance, uh, let's say compared to, compared to Paris, and also uh, Mexico City is quite sprawled because proximity indicator, how many people you can, you can find nearby, uh, is very much related to density. Uh, we, we can also see for other cities what are the underlying factors to their public transport uh, accessibility. Uh, let's say uh, in Santiago, we also see that the city is very sprawled and proximity is very low, though public transport performs much better. Um, and. Uh, as a second part of the project, we also looked into how, what is happening inside of the cities. What are the areas uh, where people are lacking access by different modes? And here we see the case of Mexico City, um, access by car and by public transport. And what we see here is indeed by car you can access most of the, most of the areas in Mexico City, most of the jobs in Mexico City, whereas by public transport, it's, it's, it's not very comparable because there are absolutely no areas. When we put um, car and public transport on the same scale, there are no areas where you can access similar amount of jobs compared to car. And we also see that accessibility is very centralized. This is um, the orange line is the urban center and uh, this is the administrative Mexico City. Um, so we looked into the reasons behind, uh, also I'm, I'm forgetting that I'm having another slide on this. Um, as I said, we were discussing, um, we looked into the contribution of informal transport. And what we see here is that outside of Mexico City, um, these results would have been even lower if it was not for the contribution of informal transport. Um, what we also see, these are the areas where um, absolute accessibility is improved by somewhat 80 or 100%. What we also see is that, uh, this is the map from Where Is My Transport with the density of network. And what we see is that um, in the areas where network is extremely dense, accessibility improvements are extremely marginal. Whereas here, where in, in this uh, outside of Mexico City, where routes are, let's say, less dense, and this is where it, it, it contributes a lot. Um, so talking about proximity, we also saw that uh, jobs in Mexico City are highly centralized. Uh, these green areas correspond also to areas where most of the high-income people live and where uh, most of the people opt for using private vehicles. And uh, the, the, um, the paradox here is that this, as you may, may remember, these are also the areas that are very well covered by public transport. Uh, however, it looks like people do not necessarily use it very much, so it has to do with several factors, those being quality, perception of public transport, and so on and so forth. Um, and to finalize my presentation, we also looked into what, in terms of uh, public transport performance, how many opportunities you can actually uh, locate it in proximity you can access. We see that um, informal transport expands the area where you can access more than 80% of opportunities that are located nearby. And this, uh, one of the assumptions behind that is that uh, informal transport helps to link formal public transport network, those being metro, um, regular buses, and BRT, to further areas. However, we still see that there are a lot of areas where people have absolutely no access to any job opportunities. Um, so we did similar analysis to for uh, three other cities. I'm not going to delve into the results. Um, we are currently finalizing this report, and um, um, thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, indeed. Uh, I'm a, please have a seat. Uh, thank you, wherever you like. Uh, thank you so much to Louis uh, from the European Commission for kicking off the findings to Dimitrios and Tatiana, both uh, policy analysts at the ITF, for rounding it up. And uh, the findings uh, have been published. And uh, as my understanding, they are right there at the table. So when you uh, leave the room after the session, please do not hesitate to get your copy. Indeed, very, very interesting findings. Uh, now it is up to this wonderful panel to pick up what we have just heard and make sense of it all and perhaps dive a bit deeper within the next uh, 60 minutes. I'm delighted to welcome Aime Aguilar Haber. She, of course, is a team leader for the field of climate change mitigation environment directorate at the OECD. Very familiar with the ITF, of course. Uh, glad to see you here. We have the executive director of LSE Cities and the associate professorial research fellow at London School of Economics. London came up quite a bit, so, so I'm sure uh, many of uh, much of what was said sounds familiar to you, Philip. We have a transport principal specialist at the Institute. American Development Bank's already been said, uh, Ernesto Monter, from whom we will hear. We have the Urban Mobility Director at WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities, Sergio Avelleda. And last uh, but not least, Clayton Lane, who's already been mentioned for going to Mexico City and providing some of the data. He, of course, is a Director of Business Development at Where Is My Transport. Aime, um, you are originally from, from Mexico. Ma many of uh, what was presented uh, uh, does sound very familiar to you, I'm sure. Uh, what, what's the most starking uh, findings that, that you take away, particularly through the lens of climate change? I mean, we're talking about green transport for so many years now. Uh, what, put, put the findings that we have just been, uh, that we just heard in, in the context of climate change. Okay, so uh, I think that a, a very important point to say is that climate action uh, to be feasible socially, political, politically, but also to uh, be cost effective needs to ensure a two-way alignment between climate goals and wider well-being and sustainability outcomes. And uh, I think uh, accessibility in the case of transport is at the center of ensuring this two-way alignment. And so take any uh, climate uh, action, for example, a carbon price, which normally is uh, set out uh, through fuel prices. If you're not able to ensure uh, access through alternative sustainable modes, what do you get from, from putting in a carbon price? Well, not much, because what you're doing is you're imposing a, an important burden on the population. You're not getting modal shift. And I think that that is also what, what these results are saying. Where are the alternatives? Can uh, your different uh, population around the city uh, can you guarantee this access through alternative uh, sustainable modes? And I think uh, in terms of this two-way alignment, it's really about what uh, you open up by saying, we need to shift from physical movement to accessibility, yes. And we need to shift uh, the performance of these uh, modes, because what is happening now is that the most sustainable modes, those that have the potential to create access in a more uh, sustainable and efficient way, bicycles, uh, surface public transport, uh, and uh, even uh, now, well, pedestrians, of course, and even now the scooters are fighting over the minority of resources and the minority of the public space. So. How does that make sense? It doesn't make sense in terms of climate change mitigation. It doesn't make sense in, time, in terms of wider well-being or sustainability goals. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you later whether you think policymakers uh, have that uh, agenda properly uh, uh, I I implemented I into their daily work. But Philip, I want to bring you in here. Um, uh, London, of course, you, you are based at LSE. Uh, London has come up quite a bit. Uh, what's, what struck you the most when you, when you heard the findings? Yeah, thank you. I mean, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, the team um, doing this kind of fantastic work. It's exactly what we need. I think we have been waiting for some of us decades to have much more authoritative data that is comparable, not only within Europe, but in this case, even uh, including the Latin American experience, I'm sure soon 
uh, the whole world. So fantastic job done. For me, the most uh, interesting diagram was actually early on uh, just contrasting all the European cities, how this trade-off between the nearby and the car performance really played out, with the exception of then the red cities, as I remember. So there are these rich stories in there which are so important to unpack further. What I would also add is we need to caution uh, all of us working on this uh, with quite rapidly communicating very strong messages, because within the data which we're now happily accessing, there are enormous biases still. And I just want to give you the most obvious one, which is uh, access to opportunities. Yeah, what are these opportunities? Uh, and while you guys were presenting, I was always wondering, like, you know, if my opportunity is a beautiful street, that's what I want to access. You know, your whole equation gets entirely destroyed. Uh, so th it's something which we need to keep in mind, but nevertheless, fantastic work, and we can really start having a conversation about it. Now, I'm, am I surprised about where London is? No, not at all. I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious, and intuitively, uh, we kind of always sense this. It's fascinating to see how much London is an exception. Mm. Uh, and I think that, again, is something which we need to pick up, not just in urban transport work, but in urban studies more generally, that ultimately a lot of our policies are really working with exceptions as reference points. Uh, using these pilots, using these wonderful uh, studies, experiences that come out of these, you know, mega cities of policy innovation uh, are very difficult to then accommodate uh, in a more decentralized, uh, more regional uh, urban uh, area in you know, the middle of Europe. And I think that's something which we need to be far more careful about, and very good warning uh, with the exception of London. Mm. Uh, Ernesto, London is one example. Latin American cities, we, we saw quite a, quite a list of those. Uh, what, what do you make uh, of the findings, particularly when you look at Latin America? Um, yeah, thank you. I also want to echo and congratulate for all these efforts, particularly because in Latin America, there is no common benchmark or, fr or framework for like measuring accessibility. So this is great. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that we can just like um, be part of this effort. Um, I also, I mean, I, I'm also from Mexico City. <laughs> so it's kind of strange to have like two panelists from Mexico City. And I was, I was surprised that um, so of some of the particularities of the results, no? for example, like, Tatiana did an amazing job presenting the, the, the results, but some of the things that, that strikes us is like, even in Mexico City, which by some standards is the most congested city in the world, car continues to be the preferred option to moving around the city. No? And then you could like, probably like justify some of these things, but when you start like digging into like the accessibility that you could have in a one hour trip using public transport mm -hmm. versus car, it's, it's shocking. Like for example, you could access 90% of all available jobs in the city using a car versus accessing 30%, 30% in the same period of one hour using public transport. And this is typically, I mean, and, and, and this is typically uh, a, a disadvantage for the low income population. So we're also talking here about aspects of inequality, aspects of urban planning, et cetera. So having that data is like really important and it's going to, we believe it's super helpful for, uh, decision, for, for decision makers. One of the other aspects and it is that, that I also wanted to like highlight from, from, from the study was like um, the way public transport can be improved to provide better access, no? I mean, probably we will never get to like the levels of London in, in, in Latin America. But for example, one of the, the, the examples in the, in the reports that also struck me the most was that in Mexico City, even with like the whole different modes of transport, metro, BRT, light train, uh, informal transport, buses, etc., making a kind of a, a comparison with Santiago in Chile, mm -hmm, you could see that the efficiency of the system is almost half compared to a system in Chile, in Santiago, that has been restructured and has been integrated. So what 
that tell us is that basically there's an opportunity of restructuring some some existing systems and getting more efficiencies. Mm -hmm. no? And I'm going to just like stop at that. Absolutely, and I'll come back to you, of course, as uh, we we move along, Sergio. I want to bring you in here quickly because uh, uh, obviously uh, also the data is something of keen interest uh, to you. Well, what's your what's your take? What's your interpretation? Perhaps even perhaps you can frame it in the Bra through the Brazilian lens as well. Yes. Um, I'm from Sao Paulo, uh, and uh, I had the opportunity to work in, in different uh, models, to manage different models in the public transportation system in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the biggest city in South America. We are more than 12 people in the city and 23 million people in the metropolitan zone. And uh, in the last decade, Sao Paulo uh, has been growing in the same way that the cities in the South Global. We sprawled our cities for uh, so far distance, people start to live distant from the economical uh, centralities. And uh, I will bring you an example. We had two districts in Sao Paulo. One is Moema, one of the richest, richest districts in Sao Paulo, and another one is Jardim Angela, one of the poorest district in Sao Paulo. The physical distance between both districts is around 14 kilometers. One person who lives in Jardim Angela commutes in cars, in private cars, more than one hour and a half to reach job opportunities. If this person elects public transportation, in the peak hours of morning, it could be more than two hours and a half. And uh, the result of uh, this inequality of access, lack of access, we will have in Jardim Angela a life expectancy around 56 years old. In Moema, eight years old. We are not talking about the south and north global difference. We are talking about 14 kilometers difference. Of course, it's not uh, caused only by the, the transportation access, but transportation access has the power to decrease this social distance, to turn the social distance closer than the physical distance. And uh, uh, it's not only in Jardim Angela, in general, people who, lives, who live in these poor districts in Sao Paulo has the same issue to access opportunities and uh, access uh, public equipment. For example, Moema has 34 hospital beds for 100,000 people, and Jardim Angela has two beds. And uh, I think one of the first uh, uh, approach, and uh, because that uh, these reports and yesterday WRI launched the uh, its report about accessibility. Uh, we need to measure uh, the efficiency of the public transportation, not only in how many kilometers we offered or how many kilometers we are constructing, but we need to uh, start to measure it, how we are reducing these social and economical distances in cities. It's a new way to measure the efficiency of the transportation uh, systems in these cities. And something that as we go along, the awareness for it is, is rising, uh, hopefully or thankfully. Now Clayton, uh, Tatiana has already mentioned how, how crucial you were for generating the data for the findings in Mexico City, a vast city of course, we're talking here at the end of the day, more than 20 million uh, people. Give us a sense, give us a sense, how did you do it? How did you undertake yeah. such a vast uh, task? I wanted to start actually with why we collectively wanted to take on this, this enormous task. Uh, until this study, there had never been a complete, accurate map of public transport in this major city in the world. And I think that's a remarkable statement. And this is true for most cities in less developed countries. In Mexico City in, in particular, Tatiana mentioned that informal uh, public transport added something like 54% to the accessibility score for travelers. But in terms of actual uh, trips, um, nearly 70% of public transport trips 
happen on these informal modes. Uh, so it's an extremely important part of the public transport network. Uh, and you, you can see the, the physical extent of the, of the informal system was so great. Um, but I wanted to highlight, as Sergio was just highlighting, the social inequities of location um, it, are so important. Um, informal mobility uh, plays a very important role in, in beginning to, uh, to reduce those inequities. In Mexico, like in many countries, uh, much of the social housing has been built in, in fairly inaccessible locations, very distant from the city center, on relatively lower cost land on the outskirts of the city. And it's very common to hear about or, or experience commute times to jobs of upwards of two hours in one direction. Um, but that experience that people have, uh, particularly low-income households, is fairly invisible to policymakers and planners because of a lack of data. Because there's, there simply isn't data and there's somehow faith uh, about the informal mobility system reaching the rest of society. Um, and and I, I believe that there is, it, it, it is an immoral inequity to persist in cities to allow low-income households to experience such lower accessibility. So what we tried to do here through the city, uh, through, the, through the study, was to, to find, to discover where these informal systems actually serve. Again, in Mexico City, it's upwards of, a, of around 14 million trips per day on these informal uh, public transport systems. Um, and so mapping this was quite, um, quite a fun exercise, a very, a very important uh, fundamental exercise, but also very challenging technically. How do you cover uh, an enormous city of 22 million people uh, with around 30,000 minibuses in around three to four weeks and map that entire system? Uh, that was quite, uh, quite a technical challenge. And I'll be happy to talk about that later. But the reason why we need this to begin with is because we as a community, as investment banks, as NGOs, um, we are making investments or advising investments of, say, billions of dollars into new metros and BRTs and social housing without understanding where upwards of 70% of the public transport system actually serves. We're not, we're not understanding uh, the ridership, the revenue, who uses it, the experience of people, whether they can afford the bus, how many jobs they can access, and yet we're making huge investments in infrastructure, very much necessary investments. But these investments need to be better informed, and that's why this data is so valuable. You say you were surprised uh, to find out that uh, such data has never been generated for a city of that size. Why do you think that is? Well, I wasn't surprised, but, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's very common because there, there simply hasn't been an economical, technical approach to actually tackling that enormous challenge. That is changing now. The technology the, it now exists. Um, the professional project management to uh, map uh, such an enormous system now exists. We're, we've shown that here. Um, I believe it, it's a fundamental task of any, um, any investment project to really first understand where the entire public transport system actually serves. I mean, we, we heard now it's become abundantly clear that uh, improving access in cities for everyone is not luxury, it's a necessity and sometimes even a matter of life and death. Uh, if, if I'm looking at the staggering numbers of life expectancy that, that uh, Sergio provided to us. Uh, so what do we do with these findings? How do we now reach the key decision makers to elevate this? Well, I think that uh, for both projects, I mean, uh, the value is also to move already the discussions uh, from physical movement to access. And without uh, the correct indicators, we wouldn't be able to do that. So that's kind of a first uh, thing to come up uh, to policymakers and saying, well, this is the reality of your city. This is what is happening. And uh, this is in terms of equity, in terms of climate change mitigation, your potential. I mean, I, I, I think I agree with a lot of things that have been said. Maybe the only one that I would say is contestable is that uh, you said that uh, Latin American cities will probably never be able to get to London uh, type of <laughs> <laughs> mobility. And I think that uh, it's not necessarily true. I think that a lot of things need to be done. I think that uh, the pace and the extent of the transformation that we have to make, which is, uh, I mean, in terms of climate change mitigation, we know we're approaching a day zero. 
and that has to be uh, reflected on how we are uh, approaching the revolution that we have to make in terms of transport. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think that in reality, all of these indicators uh, for access, which can also be more and more linked to uh, the behavior and how to change uh, behavior through creating accessibility through different modes, can be made. And uh, paradoxically, um, in a way, we need a lot of uh, different private uh, stakeholders, for example, but we need much more than the market to do it. So what do we need to do? We need to start assigning a budget, to start assigning resources, to start assigning priorities in the transport sector in terms of access, in terms of equitable access, safe access, and sustainable access. Because this is what is lacking. And I think that it's uh, uh, really interesting to see how uh, informal transport has been there to, to bridge a gap in terms of access, but we cannot forget that this access is not as safe, as sustainable, and as convenient as a, a formal integrated network. And so when we see the differences of who has been able to create much more of these conditions, we see where we need to go. And, you, and, you, and you think the awareness is there? You, you think the awareness is sufficiently there on the policy level making? Not at all. Mm. I think it's, uh, it, uh, accessibility is getting uh, a lot more in the discourse, but I think that, and that's why accessibility indicators are so key to these, because without them, you cannot set criteria, you cannot set uh, indicators for showing programs in terms of access, and without these tools to articulate from the discourse to the action, you will never be able to create real awareness. And the day that we see funding, resources, really uh, uh, being coherent with the modes that can uh, drive access in a sustainable and equitable way, that day we can say that uh, we've uh, kind of won the battle of what we're trying to say in this panel. So, Philip, still uh, much remains to be done. The awareness needs to be heightened. Reports like the ones, the findings that we heard this morning can contribute, of course, uh, mm -hmm. to the discourse. Uh, what else? Uh, how do we raise the awareness? Yeah, so I, I think this is the crucial question. Um, how does all of this land in the real politique of our countries and cities? And that's, of course, that remains an enormous challenge. Uh, not least because this stuff is intellectually challenging. I don't know how it was for the audience. I mean, I have been studying this stuff for 20 years. Following your presentations is not easy. Uh, you know, you're really trying to, okay, is this now connectivity? Is this accessibility? Is this physical? Da -da? And it's not your fault, right? Very important. It's because this is complex stuff. Uh, and, and what we're talking about is the equivalent of, uh, you know, what broadly speaking in economic development, how you overcome GDP. That's what we're trying in the transport space, moving away from movement into accessibility. It's just as challenging and it will require another 50 years at least. So what can we do in the meantime? In the meantime, I think we need to report back into fairly contained and robust areas of knowledge uh, and policy making. It's not going to change overnight. Transport, transport ministries will remain with their remits, uh, primarily focusing on movement as we have seen it for a long time. But using a very sophisticated communication strategy backed by this new evidence to report back and translate into those contained silos and communities is the task ahead of us. Uh, and that requires us um, to really use some of this impetus to then talk to a transport engineer who has tra been trained for you know, decades that it's all about connectivity and movement, how you can potentially, with that expertise, still embrace the accessibility story. And that's a task for all of us. Uh, we have actually yesterday morning launched a report where we're trying to think about national transport policy that takes account of uh, this issue of accessibility was a report uh, prepared for the Coalition of Urban Transitions. And I have a few more copies here. And it was an attempt through experts in the field to do this translation service. Mm -hmm. Ernesto, uh, looking at Latin America again, uh, now we have the findings. We know something needs to be done in order to improve the lives uh, of many. Uh, what can be done? Perhaps even uh, what can the Inter-American Development Bank do in this regard? I guess, and I wouldn't agree more, I think. First, we, we're trying to support the generation of knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
The generation of information. I, I, I think information is key for making decisions. I mean, one of the key questions of this session was like, uh, how can you manage something that cannot be, that, that isn't been measured? So these efforts, like for example, working with ITF, doing these reports, then disseminating these reports, and training the officials in understanding, because I mean, this is complex. It's not it's not easy training this, and and basically, I guess like I, I I'm positive. I think there's a trend. Yesterday, WRI and Sergio presented a report. I think things are, are shifting in a way in like starting measure accessibility compared to like the old school of like just measuring infrastructure or measuring traffic. So I, I think we're like in the right path. S secondly, we as a multilateral bank, we have a constant dialogue with our member countries, with the governments. So what we typically would do is like help them understand, help them with soft, soft resources um, to apply these concepts. We started with four cities with this study. We hope to that we can replicate this in other set of cities. And third, I think what we're trying to do now is just to go like, when we're financing projects, go beyond the concept of that we're only financing infrastructure. You know? I mean, transport goes beyond uh, railways, roads, ports. Mm -hmm. Transport is mobility, transport is accessibility, and it's also cope with urban development. So for example, some of the things that we're doing now with like the, the, the first line of metro in Bogota, a big part of the uh, of the project and the investment is basically urban development. Mm -hmm. We're trying to just like complement this with a transport oriented development and not only finance the infrastructure, but you know like to like to better sidewalks, to to make safer is, 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 lanes for cycling and all these other aspects that are not necessarily part of the infrastructure the transport infrastructure project to make sure that the project can be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Sergio, uh, I saw you take uh, uh, diligent notes, uh, particularly when Aime was speaking. And clearly, something struck a call. Uh, do share. Thank you. Yes, uh, in our study that we launched yesterday and is able to download in our website, we use uh, the cr criteria about the distance and cost to commuter because cost is an important element. Uh, to include or exclude people in public transportation. If you are in Sao Paulo around 5 a.m., 6 a.m., we will, you will observe a lot of people walking large distance. They are not concerned about physical condition. They don't have money to pay the public transportation. So cost is an important element to measure accessibility uh, in our public transportation systems. And I think we need to connect with our colleagues from urban planner areas. Because when, for example, the city government will approve a new neighborhood, a new neighbor, you need to use accessibility as a criteria to approval or not approval. This new neighbor will increase accessibility or will decrease. In general, in South Global, the new neighbors are contributing to decrease accessibility. And it's a very important tool to contribute to increase accessibility. If these neighbors will be designed to have mixed use, to have good public inf uh, infrastructure, good streets, good design streets, good public transportation systems, they will contribute. But in general, they are implanted without these uh, stuffs and uh, it decreased the accessibility in cities. And uh, one point more, uh, when we showed the, the system in Mexico City, we observed how is important the public, uh, the paratransit system to, to increase accessibility. Sao Paulo in 2004 created the integrated fare system, one card, for all public bus transportation system, and it, in this occasion, we created a discount for to use one more than uh, uh, bus travel. It increased a lot to use the public transportation system. And in 2006, we integrated the same card to the trains and metro system. Well, two years after this integration, metro increased the 50% of the number of the passengers. But it created a huge problem to pay this integration. So when you are talking, integrate the public transportation as an important solution, two things are important to be considered. First of all, good 
institutional design. London has a wonderful institutional metropolitan authority, but you need to explore this solution in our metropolitan zones in the South Global. Sao Paulo has 39 public authorities deciding about public transportation, 39 different fares, 39 different ways to pay. And second, we need to create funding to support public transportation. Cost is a very important thing. Rio de Janeiro, here we have Rafael who studied this case, uh, he spent more than $2 billion to construct a new metro line, the Line 4 for the Olympic Games. But they didn't design the integration fair. So this demand studies planned to transport more than 330,000 people per day. And now they are transporting around 180,000 people per day because they don't have integration fair between BRT systems and metro line. Uh, and Sao Paulo, uh, as I said, is a good example. When you have integration, uh, we can improve a lot of accessibility. Because that people who integrate bus and metro, they reduce a lot their commuter times. Uh, very interesting figures indeed that you're providing us with and figures that we need, data that we need. You, Clayton, have already pointed out the importance, the relevance of data in order to not just assemble those findings but also take the next steps in order to improve the accessibility. Um, how do we generate more data? Mm -hmm. uh, is, I, I, I understand that you are pleading for an open platform that, that everyone uh, can subscribe to. Tell us more about exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. And I brought just two images I'd love to show if the Booth could bring them up, slides 15 and 16. Um, there, there's now technology available from several, ah, that's not mine, it's yeah. your slide. <laughs> um, Sharing I'm, slides I'm, here. I'm, is this, uh... I'm a special advisor to Where Is My Transport, um, and I'm pr quite proud of what this company has been able to develop, not the only ones in the world, but certainly very, very strong. The ability to manage a professional project with excellent technology to map um, an, an enormous system like this in a very short time, in this case, only four weeks. Um, yep, if you just skip forward a, a couple more slides. Um, it was a great challenge, and uh, we started the project at the beginning of November. Ah, perfect. And uh, had to finish it by the end of November, which is quite a challenge in such a very short time. Um, here, actually, this shows uh, the formal and informal systems. So formal is in black. This is the enormous metro and BRT and bus system of Mexico City. But you can see here uh, just how much more extensive is the rest of the system that carries 70% of all uh, trips in the city. Uh, but I wanted to actually show you this here. Um, so this is the resulting data that we got. Um, the blue lines are the combination of all other available data sources in the Mexico City region. Uh, this includes um, the, uh, the, the directly operated systems by the public agencies. It includes all of the concessioned systems where there's data available. And also there was a really fun Mapaton community project where many people were empowered with an app uh, to simply ride the buses and find out where they go. All of that data is in the blue, and you can see that um, the Where Is My Transport project was able to discover about 40% more public transport service through this uh, professionally managed project. Those services are shown in yellow. It's not just more extensive as on the left, but on the right you see also more dense. There's just, um, if you really like zoom in there, you'll see there's just so many more routes that we discovered that had not been discovered through all of the rest of these, uh, these efforts. Uh, so the data quality difference is substantial. And this really plays out in terms of actual accessibility analyses and planning. If I myself can flip to the next slide, here. So it's kind of small here, but just look at the, uh, the example on the left here. WIMPT, that's where is my transport. These are, these are journey plans using our data versus, say, Google Maps. On the left here, you see uh, the very same um, pair of journeys uh, with either where is my transport data or Google Maps. On the left here, 28 minutes for this particular trip, a one-seat ride on an, an informal pesero. Uh, on the right, uh, on Google Maps, you would have to take two metro lines with a long walk at each side, a total of uh, 39 minutes, 25 of which would be walking. Clearly, the way that a, a, a person will actually travel in Mexico City is on the left. 
This is the way that people are actually getting around. And that data, that result, is the one that we want to understand to perform a proper accessibility analysis, like, uh, like the group here with ITF was actually able to do. So this is the value of having the right data. And the way we did it was quite, I, I feel was remarkable. Uh, such a large city in a short time, we actually conducted three simultaneous projects in the north, center, and south, treating Mexico City as three cities, because it's so enormous. Um, and uh, we have an app. Uh, called Collector, that is GPS enabled. We we hire we partnered with with uh, local um, advocates who are very knowledgeable about the system, uh, part uh, of the Open Streets uh, Network community, to manage a professional project with us. We hired 35 local data collectors. Again, empowered them with this Collector app that's GPS enabled, and they rode the entire system. Uh, for four weeks, rode every single minibus that they could discover. Uh, and the GPS passively tracked their travel time and location, and they also tracked, as, as they were riding the buses, uh, all of the boardings and alightings at every single stop, and the fares, um, and the frequencies. So we really have a very rich data set uh, that goes beyond uh, the other data sets in quality as well. Meanwhile, uh, the back end it's not just collecting the data. You have to process it as well. You have to snap these squirrely GPS lines to the actual grid and so on. So we had our, our processors back in Cape Town, South Africa, working simultaneous, uh, 12,500 kilometers away, simultaneous with the data collectors on the ground, finding where there were gaps in their own data, telling them this in almost real time so that in the following days they could go back out and recollect that data. So it was quite an extraordinary project conducted across two continents uh, in three different, um, from three different offices in Mexico City, again, with technology paired with local partnerships and knowledge uh, to be able to really tackle this challenge. But you know, if we can do it in Mexico City, then we, our community, can do this in any city. And it absolutely should be done in any city at this point because it is possible. Quite an ambitious undertaking, uh, but a necessity, uh, as you pointed out, ladies and gentlemen. I think I speak for all that w within such short amount of time, we've already absorbed such a vast uh, amount of information. So I'm sure a lot of food for thought has been given to you both by our four speakers and the panel. If there are any questions, any remarks, I'd like to bring you in here at this point. We have microphones. I already see three hands up. So uh, four hands up. Go right ahead. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Christoph Andrie, consultant from uh, Stuttgart in Digital Mobilities. I have one question um, to the last speaker. Um, uh, knowing that, for instance, Amazon uh, uh, analyzes very well what the people are selling in Amazon and then do it themselves. So how do we make sure that uh, Paracent uh, uh, Transit uh, will cooperate? Because what we have seen is that they have uh, 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 quite a, a few much better routes than public transport may have, and I think this should be encouraged and somehow inc uh, included. So which are the strategies after you have the data? Clayton? I, I kind of missed the question. Is it how to co collaborate with the private operators? Uh, with the informal uh, operators, they, they, they find a new way, do it informally, share the information somehow with you, and the question is, are they rewarded for this, or will they be thrown away because they have the route and know the bus is driving there? Yeah, I mean, this is a very important public policy topic. Some cities are trying to eliminate the informally provided services. Um, I personally believe that we really need to incorporate and integrate, as Sergio was describing, this integration between metro, BRT, bus, informal bus is critical. It all does start with the data. You know, the city, the government authorities need to understand where the services go. And I think that can empower the city and the private operators to work together collaboratively with transparency about where services serve, how many people ride them, what the revenues really look like. Um, but it is still a matter of public policy to use that data in a productive way, not in an acrimonious way to eliminate these services. Now, we did this study here uh, without a, a intense collaboration with the informal providers. We just rode their, said, hello, we're gonna ride your bus, <laughs> and then we rode the bus. Um, you know, we got the data very quickly, but a much more ideal situation is really through a collaborative effort, and that is ideal exactly what cities should be doing. All right, uh, many more questions we have. Uh, Stephen, you were up next. Uh, I'm going by the order that the hands were raised. Uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, Stephen Perkins, from, also from the ITF. I just wanted to point out two things. Um, 
The London case being such an outlier is very interesting because they perform very badly in delivering access by car. But when you look at the total uh, access delivered by all the systems, London performs identically to Paris, for example. So you can either do it with a car or you can do it with public transport. I mean, London's the only case that stands out there, but there must be others somewhere in the world. Um, in London, it's partly accident. There was decisions, well, failure to find the money to invest in motorways at a certain point going right into the middle of the city. So the city had to adjust and do it without these motorways, and it did. And then the second thing is um, there, was, uh, there were comments that said you have to replace these informal systems of micro transit, of, of micro buses with a formalized, structured public transport classic system of buses, BRT, metro, and so on. Well, that's one way to do it. From the data that we have there that's going to be published in, uh, in a couple of months' time on the Latin American cities, you can see Santiago and Buenos Aires have achieved much better access through public transport by going that route. But you can also do it by improving the micro buses and the informal transit. And there are initiatives now in Mexico City from startups getting into the sector which are making the systems work much better with an app to reserve a seat, to work out the route beforehand. So you can do it both ways, and you just have to be a bit careful about saying only the government can do this. It can be done lots of different ways. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, the lady all the way in the back, did you have your hand up? Can I just say something? Yes, of course, I mean, please. Okay, so yeah, I, I would just like to maybe link your, your last point, Steve, with uh, something that was said here on in terms of metropolitan transport authorities. I think that uh, it's not necessarily the fact of uh, substituting who provides the service. It's not a matter of monopolizing that uh, the service by the government uh, specifically, but it's a matter of who regulates. And I think that even in the case of Mexico City, you're not even talking about completely informal services because these people have concessions that were provided by the government. It's just that the government has not been doing a regulatory job to uh, impose minimum standards of service of affordability, of uh, many things as uh, Transport for London has uh, done. So I think that either by uh, having a stronger role in the provision from the government side or by uh, um, having a lot of different private uh, entities that come into the system, the key is that the governments need to regulate and set the standards of where services need to go and what they need to provide. Thank you so much. Uh, go right ahead. Uh, oui, bonjour. Je suis au ministère de l'Environnement. Good morning. I'm with the French Ministry, and I have a question regarding informal transport systems. What exactly do you mean by it? Is it hitchhiking? Is it small trucks or buses that hold a number of passengers? Is it individuals? I would think it is important to define what informal actually is, and it is also a little bit paradox because some transport modes are presented as outdated in Latin America, and at the very same time, precisely these recipes are used again. They're just named in a different way now. They're called car sharing or receive a new name or walking, so I think, dialectically speaking, it's to and fro and because between something that seems to be outdated now in Latin America and at the same time is redeveloped in Europe for sustainable transport. Thank you very much. Does anybody? Some of it got okay, lost in so, translation, I believe. But, uh, so correct. what I would say is that it's a it's a very good question because I I guess and I'll I'll ask Clayton about this that and it has to do with what I was saying in Mexico City. Do you are you are we talking about microbuses as informal transport? As, as uh, are we talking about it as semi? Uh, semi-informal or semi-formal transport. And I think that uh, what you're talking about in terms of uh, the, in, in France, for example, is whether all of these other uh, car sharing uh, private initiatives 
uh, do you consider them as informal transport or not? Which is an interesting question because it's uh, modes that were not necessarily there before and where in many cases regulation kind of uh, comes after trying to do something about it when uh, the services are already deployed. Uh, so, I mean, in, in my opinion, it's linked to what I was trying to say. I think that, for example, in, um, in the case of Finland, uh, there has been a very innovative type of regulation, which tries to say I am, uh, as a regulator, in pro of mobility as a service. I understand that for that I have to change my regulation because I have to uh, understand that there, there is flexibility, there has to be flexibility, that different modes cannot be categorized as uh, in the closed categories that we had before, and my regulation has to uh, permit for that. But at the same time, uh, uh, I think what is very interesting of that case is that they're asking for uh, data in return so that they can track how these different uh, modes that are emerging all the time are actually delivering access. And so they're able to integrate it and, and, and have a, a real regulatory um, kind of uh, role with all the information that is provided. Right. So do you want to add to that? Yes, and I just want to link this question about um, and, and the clear responsibility of government to uh, regulate this space with another um, idea around uh, communicating this very complex stuff. And I do think that uh, the various travel apps which we're all using and populations in urban areas are increasingly relying on are actually a fantastic educational tool to become aware of accessibility in a very intuitive way. But in order for that to work, you can't have this fragmentation of apps. Uh, and that's where I think is an additional role for maybe government. And I want to refer you to the case of uh, Berlin, where the public transport operator this summer will roll out, I think in Europe, at least one of the first public transport apps, which is done by government, led by government, but on the day of um, sort of making this app accessible, already will include 15 other mobility services. Uh, and all the private players are lining up because the big cheese is already in there. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting space to watch. And I'm sure TfL will copy that as soon as possible if it's successful. Well, I live in Berlin, so if only can public transportation could be on time then afterwards. That, that, would, be, that would be lovely. Uh, I'll get right to you. You wanted to chime in for 10 seconds. Yeah, I have you on the left. Uh, just uh, to, the, to the question, uh, yes, to the lady, yes. She was French, I'm French also. I, I think I have understood. To make your good work a great work, I think that, you, that, uh, that we have to make clear that uh, we, we are talking about existences. The guy driving the car, it's his existence. And, and, and uh, we don't have to make a turbo capitalism. We, we may include them, inclusive, including their existence, into the better solution. And this, this can be a cru crucial point for the acceptance uh, uh, in, in the um, uh, society uh, uh, for this work. If after the work a better Uber comes out uh, in Mexico City, maybe that's not the right solution. At least to say, well, this is one way to deal with it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, please pass on the, uh, the mic to your colleague on the right, and then we have three more questions on this side, uh, ending uh, with uh, Lewis, and then we'll wrap it up and throw it back. Uh, go right ahead. Per Wickman from the Government Agency of Transport Analysis in Sweden. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting, all this. I'm very happy listening. Uh, my question is about, well, not the urban accessibility, but the non-urban. We have similar socio-economical uh, inequalities to, to challenge there. But uh, what is the potential for using these kinds of uh, indicators for non-urban remote areas? And, and uh, what, briefly, are the methodological challenges for doing that? And what work is currently underway in those aspects? Thank you. Who wants to take that? Wait. You, you want to answer that. Well, beautiful. That, that's the advantage of having an enlarged panel here. This is so p directly picking up on your question, uh, we have actually applied the same framework to all of the EU uh, and the EFTA countries where we looked at longer dis distances and longer um, time thresholds. And then you can clearly see also what can rail deliver in rural areas, what can public transport deliver, what can... Uh, um, for example, the combination of cycling and rail 
becomes a lot more important in more dispersed areas of population. So the framework is very flexible, but you need data, and I wanted to pick up on the point from Philip, you need data covering the entire country. So we use DTFS for public transport, but it's great if you have a centralized single access point for all operators in an entire country. I think Sweden has that, I know the Netherlands and Estonia has that, UK does not, Germany does not, uh, and I don't think France has. So a couple of hints here for a couple of the countries in the, in, in the room. Shall I follow up with my comment? Yes, please. Okay. Um, one of the things, I mean, I'm an urban planner, I'm a little bit of a fish out of the water here in the transport realm, but the goal of our admittedly somewhat complex method was to increase the uh, discussion, to expand the discussion from what does transport deliver, what does proximity or land use deliver? And I think we had the point on new neighborhoods, very important, but most people live in existing neighborhoods. And I think we underestimate the capacity to transform existing neighborhoods to deliver accessibility. And the thing that struck me most about Tatiana's presentation was the really low proximity in these Latin American cities. They're massive, but they're very spread out. Densities are uh, low. Destinations are far away, and you can continue to improve transport, but you'll only deliver what people want, access, by improving proximity. So I think that's a, that's a key point to make there. Thank you so much, uh, Lewis. Uh, Clayton, did you want to chime in? Happy to. I think the, the discussion today has been fantastic because it shows the link between data and insights, and the research has been excellent, to policy. We've had this policy discussion that's only possible because of the insights, because of the data. And I believe this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as as uh, Philip mentioned, cities need to be establishing, in my opinion, an integrated data platform. In Mexico City, there's now, it's like a petri dish of all of the different modes you could possibly imagine. And an, an integrated data platform, first, it brings in all of the different data sources, say from Uber, bike sharing, public transport, cycling, and so on, into one place, democratizes both the production and access to that open data so that researchers and citizens are empowered to analyze it, to hold governments accountable. But then also, the city can then make that data available to any connected app, meaning that Google Maps can connect in, City Mapper, the bike sharing system, and so on, so that in any of these apps, you are getting the full, complete picture of all of mobility with the accurate journey plans. It also means that the city can push out uh, in real time any updates to all of these connected endpoints. It can also receive data from them. As people use any of these endpoints, they are expressing their desired origins and destinations and departure times. All of that data then can become available to public authorities with proper privacy controls to empower the government to better plan for public transport and serve the needs of people. This idea of an integrated platform is now available in, real, in reality in London, um, and it can be available in cities throughout the world if simply there's the right government will to do it. Uh, that technology is now available. It can be done by Where Is My Transport, for example, among others. Um, and I think it's an important takeaway. Thank you. La final yes. two. Final two questions, the gentleman and then the lady right behind. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, I was puzzled by the result that accessibility by car is much better than public transportation in European cities, imagine in the rest of the world. And that gives you a really, really bad taste in the mouth because at the end, it seems to be better to go by car. And the impacts are not there, of course, but the accessibility metrics are there. Just a response probably from the research group here in ITF. Thank you so much. Please pass on the microphone to the lady right behind you, and then we'll wrap up the Q&A part. Thank you. Ophelia Betancourt from Las Palmas University in the Canary Islands. I just wonder whether, uh, what's the reality behind the figures and whether the figures are really comp comparable. Because when I saw my, my islands in your map, I just wonder whether you were considering only land transport, because there is a plenty of commuting between Tenerife and Gran Canaria is air commuting, air transport. This is a mode of transport, it's also public transport, and probably if you are not considering this, the, the results are not really comparable. And secondly, <clears throat> talking about cycling, cycling is a very contested option in the islands <clears throat> because our land is not flat, first of all. And secondly, we need to have the proper infrastructure 
to do it. We need to share the roads, and this is dangerous in the moment. So just for you to, to consider. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you so much. We're, we're running out of time, but I do want to give uh, do one final, very quick round with final thoughts. Also feel free, of course, to address some of the questions that pertain to your field. Sergio, why don't you kick it off? Quickly. Uh, yes, you are completely right. The existing neighbors, we need to redesign to solve it. To solve it. Essentially, you need to redesign our neighbors. I used to say, when you are in a city with uh, problems with uh, mobility, crowded lines or congestions, it is similar than a patient with a fever. Fever is a symptom. It's not the disease. The disease is the urban plan. And, but we need to continue to, to offer opportunities to accessibility with transportation tools while we don't have a dense city. And our recommendation, it is in our report that was launched yesterday, three uh, clusters of measures. First of all, redesign streets to be more safe for pedestrians and cyclists to incentive the use of this uh, active mobility that is much more efficient and people use it a lot. One third of the tra trips in Sao Paulo uh, is made by pedestrians. Second, integrated public transportation and it is really connected with the third option, it is managed car demand. You need to create restrictions or uh, economical uh, restrictions to use private cars in cities. If you use a car cost one dollar for you, it will cost more than nine dollars for the society. And you need this money to continue to maintain the sustainability in the public transportation systems. Thank you so much. Let's pass it on, Every Clayton. I just want to remind us all, I think this is some of the state-of-the-art practice that we're seeing today. There are very deep inequities in cities, especially in less developed countries. Deep very disturbing inequities that are um, assuaged to a small extent by the provision of informal services, but we need to improve the quality of planning to be able to properly incorporate informal services into our holistic view of public transport to serve the needs of all people. I think we've seen today a methodology for doing that, for developing the data, but also for uh, executing the analysis. The accessibility analysis here is absolutely state of the art, also how you have um, uh, controlled for biases and methodologies. Now we see all of this as possible. The data creation, the accessibility analysis. Now we as a community, I want to encourage, we need to be taking these ideas to cities and saying, look, and to the banks in this room, we need to be doing this as a standard practice to support better planning and thereby to address these deep inequities in cities. So the tools are there, no more excuses left. Exactly. So, I may. Exactly. So I think that the potential is enormous, uh, but we need to really say we need to start uh, doing real change and not marginal change, which is what basically we have been doing up to now. I think that we were talking about uh, Transport for London and London. One of the main uh, things that Transport for London has is the use of accessibility indicators in the everyday decision making of planning, of appraisal. They started with public transport uh, accessibility indicators. They're moving towards uh, cycling accessibility indicators. And uh, I think uh, that tells us that that can make a huge difference. And uh, we're running out of time. So we need to start now. Ernesto. Thank you. Hi. I think that the Latin American region is in the right path in, in terms of like considering accessibility. No? And, and I think we need to continue generating data. I think that's super important for decision makers to have like factual information. Two, I would like also emphasize that technology now helps us develop that like easier. No, I mean like in previous years you would try to do this type of analysis and it would be like so, it would take a lot of time, it would be more expensive, etc. Clayton just like quickly brief us like Probably in a month, he was able to like generate a lot of data. And last, I, I think uh, uh, what we're trying to do as a multilateral bank is to like approach the sector more holistically. You know? Even now in, in our investments, it's not only the infrastructure that we're doing. We're trying to cope that with like actions and urban development, like promoting other use of transport, particularly for the last mile, et cetera, to have that integrated system. Thank you so much. Philip, uh, final words. Yes, and I want to pick up on Dario's very important point, because I was sitting here as well and biting my tongue and thinking I need therapy after this, because, there, you know, and, and you did this, I think, on purpose, because you know your audience. I, I think this 
uh, these presentations around accessibility are at a different level of discussing issues. If they are interpreted as, you know, accessibility, urban accessibility by car is actually working rather well, we have a massive problem. Uh, I think you can only argue that case if you have entirely misunderstood what the city is about as a place to enjoy, to come together. To in and that's why I said, you know, access to a beautiful street. Those of us that are returning to cities are not doing that primarily and only because of accessibility, but it's because of spatial qualities and place functions. And if we disregard that as part of the analysis, we need to be very careful. So I think I want to leave with you with one thought about the biases which are generated by the data. And I think in our communication, uh, if Dario picked it up, if I picked it up, I think it's important when you communicate that to a transport audience, you have to have your health warnings in place. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about how to improve access in cities based on the findings from Europe and Latin America. I think to paraphrase Aime, is uh, the time is now. The time is now uh, to act. We have the data. We know that there are great inequities that need to be addressed in order to make life more sustainable and improve the well-being. Many thanks to Louis, Dimitrios, and Tatiana for kicking off this panel, and special thanks to this wonderful panel for putting the findings in the context for, I believe, speaking for the audience, has been a fascinating session. Thank you so much.